Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our fourth and final conversation on inclusive teaching for summer 2021. Today, we're gonna to be discussing inclusive design through universal design for learning. I'm Cassandra Hori. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost and Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning and Outreach. And I'm joined today by Mark Lazar, Accessibility Services Specialist and Jen Weaver, Associate Director for University Teaching at the CTLO. Um, so first I'm gonna hand it over to Jed to do a little bit of introduction um, to the whole experience today, and then we'll get into the topic at hand. Thank you, Cassandra. So today's session, our plan, um, again, we want to start with talking about a little bit about some shared terminology, uh, talk about disability at uh, university and at Caltech, um, compare accommodation and universal design for learning. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some entry level, some basic UDL that you can be incorporating in your classroom, some examples and application, and then level up for you as well for some other things that you can do and then discuss um, afterwards and discuss how you can apply this in your courses too. Our learning outcomes for today. Uh, by the end of the session, we hope that you'll be able to articulate distinctions between accommodations and UDL in higher ed courses. Uh, appreciate how these UDL strategies can support students and student learning. And again, incorporate um, selected UDL strategies into your course or courses. So let's talk a little bit about terminology. Oops, nope, I'm skipping ahead of myself. Ways to engage. Change your Zoom name to your preferred name. If you'd like, add your pronouns to your Zoom name. Please add quest ask questions. You can do so in the chat or out loud. Uh, turn on your video if you feel comfortable doing so. Thank you for those who have. Uh, try typing your question in the chat as an alternative or in addition to asking aloud. Again, always be thinking and critically thinking about our modeled and suggested techniques and strategies. And as always, take space, make space. Please ask questions and take a step back and let others engage as well. All right, what I was trying to dive into today is some terminology that we can use. Um, Diversity, again, is who, about who is in the room, who's here, um, and systemically granted access. So it might be about the identities, the lived experiences, the perspectives that are represented. But inclusion is really about whose contributions are valid, who, excuse me, valued, who feels like they can have that sense of belonging in the classroom, who receives the message that they belong and feels like they can share those experiences, perspectives, um, ideas with the class or the workshop. Some more uh, terminology for you. Equality uh, is about treating everyone the same. However, this really promotes fairness only if everyone has the same needs. And so we see this figure if we're ever got, sorry, giving students um, or spectators at a baseball game uh, the same box to stand on, we're treating them equally, um, but it doesn't mean that they're all able to see, participate in the game, participate in class. Equity is about providing what's needed for success. So that might be about giving students those different, in this case, different boxes to stand on, um, different boot camps, different resources. But this really has a focus on the outcomes. So they're all able to see, but they're doing a lot of different things. And some have to do a lot more to be able to have that same equal opportunity for success. Accessibility is really looking at accommodations related to disabilities and the universal design for learning aspect of the classroom, which we'll be talking about today. And that final idea is more about justice. So how can we give equal, equal opportunity for success to all the students in the class? How can we be removing barriers, changing the structure? This really comes back to the transparent teaching aspect that we've been talking about through the entire series. And so with thoughtful design, these may also address inclusion, ex, uh, equity, and accessibility. And finally, so we're going to be using and we have and we always use uh, evidence based teaching um, practices to inform our um, sort of greater frameworks of inclusive teaching um, and anti racist teaching. So this series is focusing on inclusive teaching, also known as equity minded teaching. This focuses on strategies demonstrated to reduce or eliminate gaps between historically marginalized and historically dominant groups. This has some aspects of the anti-racist teaching, but anti-racist teaching really focuses on the dismantling of white supremacy, racism, and other forms of bias and oppression in and through teaching and related work. I'll pass it back to Cassandra and Mark. Um, so, um... So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, 
I, um, so my name again is Mark Lazar and I'm the Accessibility Services Specialist with, um, with CAS, CAS, Caltech Accessibility Services for Students. And I want to start off today talking a little bit about disability. That's kind of my main role here is to support students with disabilities. Um, and for looking at this image, we see um, a two-sided arrow. And on the left side, um, it's pointing toward um, the word accommodations. And on the right side, um, it points toward universal design for learning. And so those can be looked at as two different uh, models or approaches to supporting students with disabilities. Um, and just to kind of give a little bit of background, um, universal design um, of learning or for learning, I should say, is based on the larger framework of universal design, which was originally um, focused on making architecture and physical spaces accessible for everyone, um, particularly people with disabilities. Um, I want to preface things by saying that disability is by no means the only population that's going to benefit from universal design for learning, um, as it's designed to support people from, from a wide range of backgrounds, cultural, educational, language, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I'd like to spend some time um, early on just kind of focusing on disability, because I really think it makes a strong case for why universal design for, for framework, for, for learning is a useful framework. Um, so go to the next slide here. And um, so just kind of a little bit of basics about disability. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act defines a disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. And going by this definition, um, approximately one in four Americans are estimated to have a disability. Um, for the, the next slide, um, um, we see some of the breakdowns um, of, of, of people with different functional disability types. Um, the most common is mobility issues, um, followed by cognition, which can include difficulty with remembering, concentrating, uh, making decisions. We also have um, about 6% of individuals have um, either deaf or hard of hearing. 4.6% um, have um, vision, either low vision or blindness. Um, I'll go to the next slide. And um, among college students, um, it looks a little bit different because we're, we're looking a little bit of a younger population. Um, the top five disabilities reported among all college students, and this does include uh, two-year college students, four-year graduate students, um, learning disabilities, about almost a third of, of the students who have disabilities fall into that category, followed by ADHD and psychiatric disabilities. Um, at Caltech, we look a little bit differently. Um, ADHD and psychiatric disabilities are, are the most common ones that we have here at Caltech. Um, and as far as kind of nationwide, um, about 19% of undergraduate students report having a disability. Um, and I think graduate students it's closer by 11 or 12%. Um, I'll go to the next slide. And um, so, so the first model that I was talking about is, you know, to support individuals with disabilities is the accommodations model. And so accommodations are adjustments designed to eliminate or reduce barriers to accessing the college environment for students with disabilities. And the keyword here is really access. So the, the job of CAS like most college disability offices is really to, to promote or support that access. Um, unlike high schools and, and primary schools, um, the college disability office isn't really focused as much on promoting student success. Um, we, we're not um, kind of, you know, access is kind of the main, main task of a college disability office. And that's for, for a number of reasons, a lot of it's, you know, resources and, and funding and things like that. Um, so a few of the more common accommodations that you might see on, on a college level, maybe um, you know, extended time or adjustments to test environments, assistive tech and software, support with note-taking, um, adjustments to uh, course loads that students are expected to take, um, things like that. Um, and so accommodations can often reduce barriers, but, but you know, one of the questions is with this model is how much does it promote equity when it comes to learning? 
um, especially since we're focused more on, on, on access than success. So I'll go to the, the next slide. And, and so some of the, the limitations of this accommodation model is that accommodations often can require additional time and effort on, on part of students and faculty in you know, coordinating accommodations. Um, and they're, they're often done after the fact versus part of the process. So, so accommodations are kind of sometimes um, a way to glue together things versus kind of building in accessibility. And um, I, I think equally as important is the fact that not all students really have equitable access to accommodations. Um, and um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so, so there are a number of barriers for students to, to access accommodations. One of the things we see a lot um, at Caltech and other colleges is, is cultural stigma, um, especially we find with first and second generation students who, who may come from families um, that don't um, necessarily are, um, are familiar or recognize um, mental health issues as, as, as being um, a disability. Um, and that can translate into lack of access to medical or psychological care um, and assessments. And I guess one example we might find is that if a student has a learning disability, the way that it's diagnosed is typically through a neuropsychological evaluation, uh, which are lengthy tests that can take place over a period of few days, and they can sometimes cost as much as $6,000. They're often not covered by insurance. And so that can be a big barrier for, for students, um, different social economic backgrounds. Um, oftentimes it takes a long time to get these appointments too. Um, and students who are diagnosed with learning disability as a child will often need to be reevaluated once they become, um, once they reach age 16 or later. So that, that can be another barrier. Um, another thing that we find is when students reach college, um, they're now in a whole different um, situation where, where they have to really locate supports and self-advocate. Um, unlike high schools, uh, where, where the school's responsibility is to locate students with disabilities and kind of hand them that support. And a lot of college students, um, you know, some don't have the parental support or know-how um, to really access th these things. Um, we find that oftentimes students on the autism spectrum um, also have difficulty, um, you know, reaching out and accessing resources. And that's, that's one population that's underrepresented at CAS um, as far as registration. Um, there's also common misperceptions that, that persist that accommodations may give students an advantage and students don't want to be seen as, as taking advantage or that they're only for students who are, who are blind or in a wheelchair, not for any kind of uh, cognitive or psychological disability. And then lastly, a lot of college disability offices are under-resourced, and at times it can take up to a month to get um, disability requests evaluated. And so if a student recently got a diagnosis in the middle of a term, they might not be able to, to get accommodations approved until that, that term is over. So those are just, just a few, um, you know, kind of equity issues that are involved in, in you know, relying on the accommodation model. Um, so the result is that many students with disabilities don't get the supports they need um, just through accommodations alone. I'm not saying that accommodations aren't, aren't useful, they're a big part of it, but that it shouldn't be the only model that we rely on. And so, so statistically, you know, we have about 150 students that are actively registered with CAS at Caltech. Um, if we're going by that 19% figure that I mentioned earlier, we should expect to have more than 400 students with qualifying disabilities. So, so we know that there are more students with disabilities than are you know, receiving services here at Caltech. Um, so from there, I want to go on and talk a little bit about the uh, universal design for learning model. And I'm just gonna really provide a brief picture and then Cassandra's gonna go more into the details of how, how this really works. Um, so, Universal design for learning expands the idea of accessibility beyond just disability. So we talk about culture, language, previous educational experience, neurodiversity, um, which include people who, um, who process information in distinct and different ways, even though they might not identify as having a disability. Um, we find that a lot of people with autism do not consider themselves to have a disability, yet 
yet they may, um, may think and process information differently. Um, so I'm going on to the next slide here. Um, and universal design for learning is, is based on creating multiple ways of interacting with things. So, so the three kind of pillars of, of UDL are multiple means of engaging with content and people, multiple means of representing information, and multiple means of expressing skills and knowledge. And so, um, so here at, at Caltech, um, there are actually a number of things that we're already doing that really kind of fit into this, this, this framework. Um, one example, I'm not gonna kind of go into all these examples, but one, one example that stands out is that um, test taking at Caltech is predominantly in take home format. And that, um, that really um, makes test taking accessible for um, a larger population of students uh, with disabilities without having to rely on accommodations as much. So a lot of colleges who have standard types of tests need to have a large proctoring center. They need to have um, a number of staff uh, proctoring staff to do that. So, so this makes my job a lot easier, um, but it also, um, you know, eliminates the need to, to rely on these accommodations. Um, another thing is that, you know, we, we were record, um, we've been recording online lectures during the pandemic, and that has reduced the need for um, certain note-taking accommodations for, for having peer note-takers, which are, are typically volunteers. Um, and, and so these are just kind of a few of, of the, the UDL practices or the practices that, that are making um, classes more accessible without necessarily having to, to rely on accommodations. Um, I do wanna go over a couple of things that, that can be improved if we're looking at making things universally designed. And, and so, so we do hear reports that you know, students um, do struggle um, sometimes with finding peers to collaborate with. And that's a big, bigger issue here because work here is so collaborative. Um, there's such an emphasis in working on problem sets. So that's kind of the expectation. Um, some students also report challenges that there, um, we could have more clearly, clearly defined course schedules, deadlines, and expectations. Um, and you know, there's some concern with students about, you know, will lecture notes and recordings still be available outside of the pandemic? Because we're hearing um, students, even without disabilities, finding that that they're really benefiting from having being able to, to go back and access these notes and recordings. Um, there are a couple things that are kind of out of out of the purview or, or out of the ability for for a lot of faculty to change. You know, one is that because we're a small school, we we um, often have fairly rigid course sequences. We can't teach the same course, you know, every term of the year. So that can often make it difficult for, for students who may need to, to go on more of a part-time schedule to really do that without falling, falling a whole year behind. And then, um, you know, with graduate students, the, the kind of funding models, um, you know, add to that difficulty as well, that it's very hard to be a part-time graduate student, even though some disabilities make it really hard to be a full-time student. And these are kind of less or more systemic issues. Um, but I wanna hand this over now to Cassandra and she's gonna talk a little bit more about, about the framework for universal design for learning. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And I think that gives us a great starting point for really thinking about what comes next at Caltech. To expand on that um, universal design framework that Mark initially um, shared, Really what's at heart here is um, going to be a lot of reinforcement of some of the topics that several of you have been part of our conversations um, in our earlier sessions, and I'll highlight those in a moment, but when we think about having available for students multiple means of engagement, um, that has to do with the format that they can engage with, that is the medium, what senses people are using. It also acknowledges and has to do with really making clear what the learning is about, what the goals are, what the applications are, how to engage with others in the class. That might sound like active learning, and in fact, it often is. Um, but this also acknowledges that um, you know students are coming with different motivations 
motivations with neurodiversity and how they connect with the material, how they're motivated um, and how their motivation works in the context of a class and also um, promotes the potential for reflection, self-assessment, those kind of metacognitive um, activities that help students become more self-directed. When we think about multiple means of representation, um, that's also some of the format and choices in media. Um, it may also involve clarifying or illustrating things like syntax or symbols, recognizing that students may come to the process of translation with different amounts of ease, different amounts of challenge and difficulty. Um, and again, as um, I think Jen talked about in an earlier session, highlighting and representing the patterns and the ways in which the knowledge gets organized um, for you as an expert with and for students is another way that students can become more flexible and find an entry point um, into the ways the information knowledge skills are represented in the class. And then finally, thinking about multiple means of action and expression, um, that is really about building in into the materials, um, the pathways for assistive tools or technologies that students might then use independently so that they can um, feed those materials you know, into tools that might help them individually. Um, and it also is about providing some options for learners to respond, to express what they know, to find support and to navigate um, the, the class. So we are kind of thinking about expanding the possibilities and the choices that students have, but hopefully today we're going to do that in a, a pretty manageable way so that you walk away with um, kind of an idea of like, you can add one, you can add one, one option at a time and those will build over time as you develop course materials. Um, just again, lots of overlap here with our prior conversations about inclusive teaching, um, active learning. So those are all starred here um, in this framework of universal design for learning. So again, things like clear and salient goals, um, representing patterns and knowledge organization, a lot to do with transparency in learning and teaching and the kind of uh, backward design process that starts with goals and outcomes and connects pieces of the course together. Uh, active learning comes in, of course, with collaboration and community. Um, our discussion about grading and feedback also comes in with the kind of constructive feedback and reflection and self-assessment that um, can be built into courses. Those are all universal design as well, but here we kind of get another layer of the rationale and the potential impacts of those actions. Um, for today, we are going to focus on some of the things here that are not starred, right, that we haven't necessarily talked about already in this series. And all of the series is, of course, accessible to all of you through um, video and slides that we have shared and will continue to share with you. So we want to begin with this kind of entry level university universal design for learning um, idea and think with you about um, about modifying, acting on the materials that you have in teaching so that you're expanding the ways for learners to interact with the content of the course. And that can be through making those more accessible through captions, transcriptions, um, graphic organizers. And we'll, we'll wrap up this section with a little activity that you can participate in to think about taking your course from a single stream to multiple streams. So a couple things, you know, um, just a few pointers about making um, accessible um, PowerPoints is that you want to use larger fonts, at least 18 point at, at the very minimum, and um, they should um, have um, any kind of included videos or multimedia content should be captioned. And, and just kind of a, a quick tip when you're, you're adding in a new slide, there is a, a new slide function that you can um, pick to um, select a layout, and that's that kind of builds in more accessibility than, than kind of manually adding in text boxes and images to the slide. And I'll share a link later on. Um, we, there's in this presentation, there's, there's a link that, that has all these tips and more. Microsoft has a really good um, guide to making accessible Office documents. Um, when you're dealing with Word um, using built-in headings and styles, um, and again, the Microsoft's page goes a little more about what those do, um, but basically they create 
kind of a logical reading structure for, for people who use um, screen readers, which include people who are blind or have um, learning disabilities that affect reading. Um, and, and for both PowerPoint and Word, as well as you know, other, other documents, um, there's a really handy tool called Accessibility Checker. Um, and that will kind of give you, um, um, it, it'll guide you toward making some of those changes. Um, and so it's a really easy thing you can do. Um, you don't have to, to fix everything, but getting some of the big things can, can help. Um, you want to use easy to read fonts and keep them consistent. And you know, one thing to look at is using sans serif fonts. Um, that can be a little bit easier to read for some people. Um, and just not changing up, you know, the, the font size or adding a lot of different, you know, italics, you know, a lot of different formatting things in the same paragraph. Um, and then with um, images, I was mentioning earlier, adding alt text, which is basically a description of an image. And if you hover your mouse over it or if you're using a screen reader, it will read out that description. So if I have a picture um, of, of, a, of a hurricane, I can describe this is, you know, um, an image of a hurricane approaching the Gulf Coast. So even if somebody can't visibly see it, they know what the picture's about. And then lastly, um, links, um, you want to keep them really simple. So um, if I go actually just, I'm going to go back to that previous slide really quick. Um, we can do that. Um, so, so in the bottom, I shared a link and it's a really long link. It's www.epa.gov backslash backslash. Um, so that um, when if you're using a screen reader, it's going to read that all out loud and it's kind of annoying for, for people who use screen readers. So it's better just to um, to have um, like a description like, um, you know, of, of what what it's linking to. So you can say EPA climate indicator web or EPA climate indicators and then just embed that link in, within that text rather than typing out. The only exception would be if you're having a really simple link like www.caltech.edu. So just a few, few tips and then I, I recommend going to the, um, to the link in the bottom and uh, the end of the, the presentation to, to get some more information on how to do those. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. And um, when you're dealing with PDFs, one of the nice things is if you create the, the document in Word or PowerPoint, then you save it as a PDF, it'll generally remain accessible. Um, and if you want to scan pages in a book or things like that, it's recommended to use a high quality scanner and uh, make sure that you know, optical character recognition is, is enabled. And usually if you're using um, Adobe, they give you an option to do that. Um, and the Caltech library actually has a really great scanner. Um, you can see to the right, there's a picture of the, the book eye scanner, um, which is great for, for quickly and accurately scanning books. Um, and then um, for syllabi, um, CTLO has a really great um, syllabus template provided and, and it, it's got built in accessibility. Um, so we recommend using that and that's on the CTLO website. Um, do you want to talk about the Canvas Accessibility Checker, Cassandra? Sure, yeah. If you're teaching with Canvas or Campus Learning Management System on any page that you edit, there's actually a built-in accessibility checker. It's an icon of a, a person with their arms out in a circle, um, and it will actually show you at a glance if you have any um, accessibility notifications that you might think about fixing. Um, here, there's just one, which is pretty minor, So, um, and I think it might have had to do with the some colors or something like that that are kind of in, endemic to Caltech. Um, so, you know, again, it's not everything, but you can definitely improve incrementally. And then back to you, Mark. Okay. Um, so if you're creating like your own website for a course, um, there is a free user-friendly accessibility checker tool called Wave, which is um, designed by WebAIM, which actually is, is one of the organizations that comes up with standards for web accessibility. And so all you have to do is go to webaim.org and type your website's URL in the box. Um, and it'll give you um, a list of things that you can fix. Um, and um, 
I guess, you know, I, I don't want anybody to be overwhelmed when, when they do that. And so you're not really worrying about fixing everything, but, you know, there's some easy to fix issues you might find like contrast or alt text. Um, just to note that some contrast errors are going to be hard to fix just due to Caltech's color scheme, because some contrast checkers find that orange to be um, not great. But, you know, anecdotally, we've heard, you know, that, that most people can read that orange, that, that it's not as big of a contrast issue as, as, as some of these checkers will, 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 will say. Um, and should I go to the next one? Yeah. Um, so captions and transcripts. So um, on Zoom, you can um, turn on live transcription and um, in your account settings. And then so that allows people to view full transcripts. So students, once you turn that on, the students will have the option of seeing, of seeing it. And um, you can, um, and, and the students can turn on and off the closed caption during the meeting. So it, it's, there's an image of a, a menu over here. Um, so it's really easy to use. Um, and you just have to make sure that every, all those boxes are checked off. Um, and and um, we'll go to the next slide here. And um, also in the settings, um, you want to select audio transcript in, in the account settings and it's under the cloud recording. And so it allows people who are, who are using um, viewing the recording in the in the Zoom cloud to to enable and to also they can also view and download the transcript as well. Yeah, those settings are actually in your Zoom profile, so it's your 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 Zoom wide setting. So you you can do that once, and as long as you're logged into the same identity within Zoom, it will stick with you. And then um, also, if you're uploading recorded videos into Canvas Studio, um, once you've uploaded that recording, you can indicate what language is being used and request an automatic transcript be added. Um, many of these tools also will let you do some editing um, of the transcript so you can you know, take a look at it if you have time, um, may maybe make a few corrections. And that's a question that came in to the chat as well. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about, about this? Yeah, um, so somebody actually had a, a great question in, in the chat about, you know, how well does the live transcription work? A lot of typos. Um, so, so that is something that, to keep in mind that automatic transcripts are not perfect. They're kind of, kind of a basic entry level way of, of providing some accessibility. Um, you know, they're, they're generally pretty useful. Um, you may have an occasional typo, but um, more often than not, not you know, students have reported that that it it is helpful. Um, and um, if there is a student who does have um, um, you know um, hard of hard of hearing or deaf, um, CAS can arrange to have a professional captioner or or like who's a human who will actually do the live captioning or a sign language interpreter if that's needed. To do that, so the student needs to request that. But but if they need that, then that's kind of a the next level of, of accessibility. And I think this is a really nice point about kind of that difference between accommodations and universal design for learning, right? The accommodations process is still there. Mm -hmm. um, and when there's a heightened need, that process absolutely should be um, accessed and used. And Mark is the, the resource uh, to, to contact on campus. And yet, you know, and this is something Mark brought up when we were preparing for this, you know, how many of you ever turn on the captions when you're watching a movie at home, when you're watching Netflix or when you're looking at a YouTube video or when you're browsing through Instagram appreciate having those captions. Um, I certainly do. I think other people do. It makes, it can make it, you know, just more accessible to catch a piece that you might have missed, to be able to access it when maybe it's not a convenient spot to be listening auditorial or, or when there's background noise or etc. Um, just to, again, it's kind of the for everyone helps for a lot of different reasons, some of which may, we may not even know all the time. So um, a second area for just to think about your materials is 
to represent the material not only in text but in graphic ways as well and uh, I know lots of you are already doing this because it's kind of built into the content that you have um, you could think about whether a mind map or a concept map and there's one shown here that actually Mark created when planning for this session um, it was a brainstorm about okay well what are all those important topics related to universal design for learning that's something you could ask students to do it's something that you can do to to represent material. We actually showed you a graphic organizer around the UDL framework um, to break out those different areas and show parallel wise examples of how those play out in course materials. And you might have a schedule in your syllabus that looks something like this that has actually a lot of information packed in and it helps to categorize and represent that spatially, which is another way in for people to access the information. And uh, this is a graphic organizer of graphic organizers and I can't not mention that meta moment in this context. Um, so here we'll take a little moment to think about how you might take a part of your course that is currently so-called single stream that's there's only one format, one medium, one way to access or represent that information and see if you could expand it to more than one way. I'm gonna give you a minute to think or write. There's some examples shown here. So if it's only text, could you add an audio introduction or a video intro? If it's only audio, could you add captions or transcripts? If there are something that's written like problem solutions, could you do a voiceover explanation, maybe of just one or a sample sometimes? Um, other text only materials, could they be represented in a graphic organizer? Let me give you um, just 30 seconds to a minute to think about that. And then I'm gonna ask for some examples via chat or voice. So um, now is the time we're going to level it up a little bit and think about the part of universal design for learning that might seem a little bit harder, but we're going to we're going to get there. And that is incorporating ways more than one, multiple ways for learners to express their skills and knowledge. This kind of is going to butt up against, I think, some of our deeply held ideas about our disciplines and how we do things, because it taps into the format of assignments and assessments. I'm going to introduce a term called construct relevance um, and think with you about some examples that might open up some choices in expression. So the concept of construct relevance, let's break it down. A construct is just a, some jargon for a skill, knowledge, or ability. And relevance is whether it's related to the intended learning outcomes, right? So basically, does an assignment or assessment require only or mainly those skills, knowledge, or abilities that are actually part of the intended learning outcomes? Or does that assignment or assessment require these extraneous skills and knowledge and abilities that may not actually be so um, related to the intended learning outcomes? So let's look at some examples. First one, um, a unit exam, a midterm exam, or a final exam. Many of you probably, and Mark talked about Caltech is not a place where we usually are doing um, in-class timed closed book type exams, but you might have had that experience. And so some of the constructs that you have to use, those skills and abilities that may not be relevant to that exam's actual intended outcomes, it could include memorization, could include working under pressure, could even include things like handwriting or, or speed of handwriting, right? If you have to reproduce that knowledge in that format in a particular amount of time. Um, some other potentially relevant skills and abilities might come into play when you go to an untimed and open book exam. Things like knowing where to find the information, which might be more relevant down the road, right? Can I get to that, you know, maxim equation um, use case and apply it? Um, and, um, you know, knowing where to find similar examples um, to be able to solve a new problem. So none of these examples are like right or wrong. I'm, we're not not saying never have a closed book exam because you might have a learning outcome that very much depends on 
having certain things be memorized, but that process of figuring out which ones are really important and then seeing if your assessments are and, and assignments are really using those skills and abilities is what we're, we're really talking about. It might sound a little bit like the process of um, designing instruction based on outcomes. Let's think about a final project. So a typical essay format could include the constructs or skills of synthesis, organization, articulating a thesis and ideas and what we might think of as traditional writing skills. If students were given the option to make a podcast or a video um, of that same final project, many of those same constructs could be at play, synthesis, organization, articulation of a thesis or ideas. Um, it may also involve a different type of outlining and thinking about timing and visual or audio delivery. So the constructs change. And again, it's, it's the instructor's ch choice and intentional choice, hopefully, about what to include. But we start to see that maybe in some cases there are more than one option. Um, often what happens, I, I know many courses where there is the content and then there's a, a language or a tool that could be um, that could be a spoken language. It could be a programming language, right? It could be an analysis tool. And so if you look at these cases, new content, new tool or language, new content, familiar tool or language, familiar content, new tool or language, and think about what's hardest here? I think most of us would say, yeah, it's going to be hardest if you have both new content and you're trying to do that with a new tool or a new language, right? So you're trying to solve an, an engineering uh, problem and you're using an analysis tool. Maybe it's MATLAB or something else that you've never used before. That's much harder. And so it's, again, it's a process of figuring out, well, what do I really want students focusing on and learning? Can I break those things apart? And might I give them a choice? Choice. Maybe in a particular course, I don't really care what tool or language they're going to use. Um, and so students might have a choice about that, whereas I really want them focused on the concepts. In another class, um, we might be really focused on the tool or the language. And so that's the part that I want to specify. And maybe I want to give students choices about some of the other pieces. And finally, presentations kind of come up um, a lot in this area. So what are the constructs and are they relevant? Um, is it important that people speak to a large group, that it be spoken or memorized? Um, would it be equivalent for some of the learning outcomes if it's a small group, if they can use visuals or notes? Um, so there are lots, of, there's a lot to think through. It's, I think, a rich idea to bring to your teaching that comes out of universal design for learning. And it really brings us back to the idea of transparency transparency in learning and teaching, which we did a session on in more depth, um, which you can find the materials for, to really be articulating and sharing with students about assignments and assessments, the purpose. Why are we doing this? What's it helping us learn? Um, what are those intended learning outcomes? The task, what are you actually asking them to do, right? Are there choices in that? And that's where this expansion of the way, the means of expression could come into play with universal design. And then what are the criteria? If you're opening up those choices for students, usually the criteria are gonna stay pretty similar because those are the things related to the learning outcomes. Um, but you may find that you can actually assess, you know, a podcast and a piece of writing using many of the same criteria. And I really just, I love this idea. It comes from this book called Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone um, about universal design for learning in higher ed. The plus one approach is basically, you know your content, you know your course, you've probably got or used assignments and exams um, and uh, other kinds of assessments. Um, is there a way to add one new option, one new format, one new means of expression and result in a more universally designed learning experience? And a way to start to access that, again, we're going to do a little bit of uh, think and then uh, share some examples and move right into kind of questions and open discussion. But I'm going to give you a, a minute or so to, I, I, and I really encourage you to think about a course in your field, one you teach, one you've taken, where just students always have difficulty. Uh, they're always asking for questions. They want a different example or an alternative, um, or they tend to make mistakes over and over again, because that's a great place to start to apply your universal design for learning 
plus one experience. Um, and so if you can, you can think of just even one of those and start to brainstorm a little bit for how you could expand ways for students to interact with that content or for students themselves to express their skills and knowledge in that area, um, that can be a great place to start. I'm gonna give you again about just like a minute to think, write, brainstorm for yourself, and then we'll come back together. I guess my take would be, you know, going back to, to to the constructs and really kind of pinpointing what are are you really trying to to measure? What what is what is the most important, you know, target that that you're you're trying trying to to assess and then really base it uh, on that. Um, and you may have to look at you know if if there is one type of presentation that seems more work intensive than another format to, to maybe um you know include like a second part of that to, to kind of even it out um to, to to even out the the amount of effort it takes to to do that there's just a couple ideas um i don't know if anybody has any others I'll echo Mark in terms of thinking about learning outcomes and like, okay, what are the learning outcomes for all of these? And they're probably the same in terms of learning outcomes. They might just be able to demonstrate them differently. My suggestion, if you're going to have two different formats is to, if, if possible, think about the rubric for evaluation before and share that with students, because I think that's going to be their most difficult part is thinking about, well, a presentation might be in their minds really much easier than it is to, or like developing a, you know, teaching snippet might be much easier than it is to develop a, a I don't know, proof, a research essay, something else. And they might not necessarily be able to see how those are both similar and or equitable in terms of evaluation. So I think giving them that, that peeling back the evaluation framework um, would be really helpful for students in that too. Um, well, I want to uh, make sure to respect everyone's time. We're just about at the hour. Um, again, we're so grateful for you all taking some time to think with us today about inclusive teaching through universal design for learning. Um, we know that students um, with disabilities, whether identified or yet to be identified, are also tending to be um, underrepresented and marginalized in STEM fields in particular. So this is an important part of the work that we do toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we are always here to consult and talk with you more. Um, many thanks to Jen and to Mark and to all of you.